Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Collider Mailbag, the all mailbag sh show here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your questions. I'm one of your hosts. My name is John Campion. And of course, I'm joined by Josh McCuga. Thanks, John. Uh, we're having a great time doing these. I'm, I'm having a blast. I love the fan yes. questions. You know, because you get to do movie talk every day. You get to and do you get TV talk. Correct. And uh, you guys do a lot more mailbag. We take, mostly take live Twitter questions now. So getting to talk more movie stuff for me is fantastic on the weekend. It's great. I Honestly, like seriously, going all the way back to the AMC days, I think the mailbag thing is, at least my on-camera stuff, I mm -hmm. think is the most fun. Absolutely. I love doing the mailbag stuff. And so <laughs> how do you get a mailbag question to us? It's simple. Just write to us at collidervideo at gmail.com. Send in your questions. We take mailbags every day, Monday through Friday on Movie Talk, but when we also have our Saturday and Sunday shows here. And, uh, you know, as of right now, the uh, Penguins are trailing the Ottawa Senators. Thanks, John. And I got to tell you, it's a win-win for me. <laughs> Because <laughs> Penguins are my number two favorite team, obviously behind the immortal, the uh, the all time, the all high Toronto Maple Leafs, <laughs> and uh, but so if so if Pittsburgh wins a series, I'm super happy. Uh huh. But if Ottawa wins a series, that means another Canadian team is going to the finals. So this is a win win for me. To and be I honest. believe the Ottawa Senators have never been in a Stanley Cup final. Uh, I don't know if that's true. Might be true. I, I, it's weird to think because they have like during the Alfredson days, days Ooh, like they've they had good. some really good teams. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, this is not <laughs> hockey talk. Okay. Let's get to the first question of the day. And the first question today comes to us from John Rambo. Hey, thanks for writing in there, John. <laughs> who writes, hey, Collider crew, my question is about Catherine Watterson. She's starred now in two major franchises, and nobody knows who she is. Uh, excuse me, Christian. So why is that? Um, yeah, she's got a crush. John Rambo's got a little crush on Catherine Watterson. On Catherine Watterson. So okay. I mean, yeah, two big major franchises. She has recently been in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Her. Mm -hmm. That puts her in the Harry Potter universe, and now she was she's in the Alien mm -hmm. universe, which. You have not yet had a chance to see the new Alien film. No, I've never seen. You are not Alien. a horror guy. Nope. Um, it's a good movie, and this comes from. I didn't like Prometheus. I think Alien, while not as good as the first Alien, and certainly not as good as the second Alien, I think this Alien Covenant movie is a real nice blend of the suspense and horror of the first Alien with the action and excitement of the second Alien. It's it's not just good as either of those, but it's a nice movie i had a really good time with it i think where, people should check it out where is the alien ride is that at universal there's an alien ride there used to be an alien ride whether it was disneyland or universal or somewhere. certainly not at disneyland well there was an alien ride i remember going on it when i was when i was a kid and that's the closest i've ever come to an alien franchise i will not i won't watch those movies they're not for me they all look about the same where you go into space and aliens try to kill you i get it one that's, of the greatest, that's my doubtfulness. One time. of the greatest things of this show, because Josh and I worked on a show together called <laughs> Film HQ, and one of the greatest things we ever did in Film HQ, because Josh does not like horror. Great being an operative word. There, He's John. not good at horror mm -mm. at all. And we made, we did this one, a sketch. it wasn't a sketch, we just did this video once where we put a camera on four of us, including Josh, watching Conjuring. Nope. And it is one of the best things we've we've ever shot. We went did. It was after great. we watched The Conjuring. We went to a screening that night, and I remember walking through the Grove and being jumpy, just being like, "We're <laughs> this." I, I don't. I, I'm telling you, I get too stressed out. My back gets all tense. Regardless, we're back at Catherine Waterson. Yeah. So why don't people know her name? Why don't people know her yet? Well, I have a theory. I think that she looks too much like Mara Tierney. Okay. Look, also, look, somebody watch. that nobody knows. <laughs> Mara Tierney and Catherine Waterston. That's Mara true. Tierney, Catherine Waterston. Oh. Yes, Jonathan. Make sure you throw in those images yeah. of the two. Um, I, but but the one uh, the one hit on your theory is that nobody knows who she, the other one is either. Correct. And she was in she was the the baby mama in Liar Liar. Was correct. She not? Yes, yes, that's right. And uh, most recently in the affair on Showtime, Martini, which I've never seen, but people like tell me it. it's good. You'd like yeah. you'd like the affair. Um, I, here's the thing, and I don't want to I don't want to come across as being like that. Sponsored by dude. Ashley Madison Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be that dude. But Catherine Waterston, a very attractive girl. They do not do her any favors in Alien Covenant, at least in the trailer, as far as like making her good looking. It's the same as they never did for Ripley. But Ripley and her have definite sex appeal. I think this is probably the breakout role that takes Catherine Waterston to the next level. Because I don't think it's Fantastic Beasts, mostly because I think Fantastic Beasts wasn't the best. And again, they kind of dumbed her down appearance-wise. Um, yeah, you disagree? Maybe. Well, look, I, I think... I don't think, um, oh, who's the one playing uh, Hella right now in Thor, or one of the greatest actresses of all time? Natalie Portman. Uh, no, 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 no. Playing the new uh, oh, villain in the oh, new Thor. Uh, 
Well, Kate Blanchett. Kate Blanchett. Kate Blanchett is not the sexiest woman alive. Yeah, but there's something. But she is one of the most talented women alive. Yeah. Look, you're also looking. Catherine's been in films like she's putting together a nice little resume for herself. Yep. She's been in movies like Inherent Vice yep. with Joaquin Phoenix. She was in Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. She did a really nice job in that. She was pretty good in uh, in Fantastic she, Beasts. She was in Boardwalk Empire, a small role, but yeah, small a, role a in memorable Boardwalk one. Empire. I think the problem is that there's it's a it's a couple of reasons. Number one, I don't think she's had a breakout performance yet. Like, mm -hmm. while I thought she did a fine job, she's definitely a good actress. And I think she did a fine job in Fantastic Beasts. Mm -hmm. But it's not like she jumped off the screen and made us walk out thinking about that character. Right. Same thing with Aliens. I think she does a very nice job in Aliens. But honestly... Uh, Aliens, you mean... Sorry, Alien, Alien Covenant. Covenant. Yep. That, uh, honestly, Eastbound and Down, uh, Eastbound and Down <laughs> dude... Uh, Kenny Powers. Kenny Powers, yes, Kenny Danny Powers. McBride. Danny McBride is the one we got there. who I actually walked out thinking I was blown away by his performance sure. in it. Same thing, there was a, Joaquin Phoenix was the guy in Inherent Vice that everybody walked out thinking about. Uh, when you're talking about Steve Jobs, like everybody's talking about Michael Fassbender coming out of that. And uh, from Titanic. Uh, Not, Kate, uh, Kate I was going to say Natalie Portman again. <laughs> We're all over the place. Over Kate place. Winslet. Kate yeah. Winslet. So people Steve talking Jones about no, so yeah. so it's a bit of a combination of that. She number one hasn't had that breakout role, okay. and number two she hasn't given the breakout performance yet. But she has been very steady and very consistent to the point now that if I see her popping up in a movie that I'm going to be going to see, I'm going to get a little bit more excited about the movie because sure. I know she brings it. She's reliable. She's dependable. She's always going to give a good performance and give her a couple more years. Give her a few more roles like this and give her a few more movies like this eventually people are going to start knowing her name building that resume yep all right let's move on to the next question the next question comes to us from chris and chris writes concerning trailers for movies do you think is good or bad if the stuff in the trailer is not in the movie especially for comedies they give you these great one-liners but then when it comes up in the movie it might not be there or might not be as funny as it was in the trailer as a big star wars fan it bummed me out when some of the cool shots in rogue one trailers were not in the movie themselves it ain't that some of the cool shots in the rogue like none of the shots in the Man. rogue one trailers were in the movie uh, whatsoever. Does that throw you off when you go see a movie? What? After watching a few trailers and you're, and you're looking for these scenes in the trailers that don't end up being in the movie? I think one of the most famous uh, scenes in a trailer not in a movie is Twister. When that car tire is rolling down the road and it smashes into the camera, oh, that's not in the that's movie. Right, yep. That's in the trailer. That is not in the movie. And I remember leaving the movie with my brother saying, where the hell was that truck tire? Right? Uh, Rogue One... I feel like that may be just one of those classic Star Wars switcheroos. Like they're going to show a bunch of this stuff that's not the that's not in the movie, so that we don't actually like the fans get to see a totally original, pro, like a totally original property we didn't show in the, in the trailer. I don't know if I I don't know if it throws me off per se, but it's definitely like if you don't see it and it was a glaring thing in the trailer and it's not in the movie, there's definitely something in my brain going, well, where the hell was that? Yeah, no, I I agree. And look, I think there is. There's a gray area here that's forgivable. Mm -hmm. We got to remember when these trailers come out, it's not like the producer and his buddy say last night went, oh, let's whip a trailer together and put it out tomorrow. <laughs> they literally make these trailers probably start working these trailers like months in advance. Oh, yeah. And they come out. And sometimes, and this is where you got to forgive the trailer people, sometimes they are working off of making a trailer for a movie that's in an early cut of the movie. Mm -hmm. And so they build a trailer based on the footage they have. And then later on, the movie, the editors and the director or the producers, they cut some things out of the movie. They change the movie around a little bit. But those guys who made the trailer have already done. They, they've got the thing. And Star Wars Rogue One is a very drastic example of that because, remember, and this is a little bit of a spoiler. If you haven't seen Rogue One, a little bit of a spoiler here. So just be, be wary. If you haven't seen Rogue I mean, One. The movie's I, already out on video. If you, if you want to see it, you've seen it. But <laughs> like the, the ending of Rogue One where they transmit the data... Yep. That was not their original idea. That was one of the things they decided to change because there are scenes in the trailers of like Jin and and Kazian running down the beach with the Star Wars yeah. plans. So obviously that, so they were going to get off planet with that. They decided to change the way they were going to handle that. But the people who made that trailer, the movie they had was when they're running down the beach yeah. with it. So they made a trailer with that. I mean, it is unfortunate the way that turned out. I'll tell you one of the things that bothers me more than stuff in trailers not being in movies is when trailers do use stuff that's in the movie but paint a completely deceptive picture. <laughs> and I've got two big examples of this. Okay, go ahead. 
Number one is a Disney film called Bridge to Terabithia. I love that book, by the way. That book is great book, book. And you know what? It's a very good movie. But it ain't the movie that they said it was oh. going to be. When you watch the trailers for that movie, it's this fantasy adventure. You think these kids are going to go in the woods Flowers. and discover a secret kingdom. <laughs> and they're going to help save the kingdom. It's about a little kid whose little kid friend dies. Yes, yes. And him dealing with it. It's... It's a totally radically mislead. It was. I remember I wrote articles. I was still running the movie blog at the okay. time, and I wrote articles about that. The trailers weren't just. Oh, it's a little bit of a, no. The trailers were completely misleading. Well, they, I think. Oh, I think they make you read that. Well, at least here uh, in my school, I think I read that book at like fourteen years old, maybe fifteen, something around there, maybe even younger. It's and powerful. I, and I remember reading that book and going, to "My mom, did they know that they were giving us this book? Because it is heart wrenching book and a heart wrenching movie. And you, if you read the book, you knew that going into the movie. But if you're just a mom who doesn't know what the book is and whose kids like this movie looks cool, it's Disney, and she's in there going, well, "What the hell is this?" I had I talked to people who were parents that took yeah. their kids to that movie and were like, what the hell? I thought I was taking my kid to see just a fun yeah. little afternoon. Now I gotta sit down and talk to my kid about death. <laughs> and death and cancer. Thanks, and Disney. Like, yeah. It's like, yeah. thanks a lot, Disney. At least in the title of Me, Earl, and the Dying Girl, you know there's, there's a dying girl. They're giving you a little bit. Good. The other big example of okay. misleading advertising, and I'm sure this part happens all the time, but this one really stood out to me. I believe it was the second film in the Mission Impossible franchise, okay. Mission Impossible 2. The one that had Anthony Oof. Hopkins in it. It was like a th that was the three hour thrill ride of bore. Oh my boredom. gosh! Yeah, it was not a Ooh. not a good outing. But here's the thing: so if you saw the movie, you know Anthony Hopkins is in that movie for about five minutes, it and you saw every one of those five minutes in the trailer because the trailer was what it was starring Tom Cruise and Anthony Hopkins, <laughs> and like three quarters of the trailer is Anthony Hopkins, <laughs> and it's like every single second that Hopkins is in that movie is in the trailer. So you go into it thinking, this is going to be a movie with Anthony Hopkins and Tom Cruise. And he's going to be the villain. It's going to be He's going to be the villain or he's going to be the main, the, the, his main boss in it or whatever, and he just ain't there. So, I mean, that stuff bothers me a lot more than stuff that's in trailers. But, but look, but I will say this. Like I was saying, sometimes it's innocent because the trailer companies, they just put trailers together with the footage they have. But sometimes it is more nefarious than that. Sometimes it is... It's like, you know what, uh, this clip, even though we know it's not in the movie, this will sell the movie, so let's put it in there. To me, that is different than an honest mistake where the trailer, we put it together based on the footage we have and they change the movie. That's fine. That's going to happen. There's nothing anybody can do about that, and I'm okay with it. But when the studios purposefully put stuff like, oh, that's not in the movie, but it, it'll be a cool shot for the narrative we're painting in the trailer, so put it in the trailer. To me, that is nothing short of false advertising. Agreed. And I honestly think... I mean, I don't want to get into too much hyperbole here. I mean, maybe it's too hy hy hyperbolic, but part of me thinks the studios that do that on purpose, film goers should start class action lawsuits and say, look, <laughs> you told me this, you sold me this. If you, if I buy it's a like box that of one Legos. Time you, you showed up that Airbnb and they advertise it on oh the beach condo God. and it was like two stools in a kitchen. No, I'm uh, kidding you not. So I go, so I, uh, me and my wife, we get, uh, we decided to go for a weekend getaway in San Diego and we, we get this Airbnb that was gorgeous. This stone fire it was a condo on us, like a 40th floor overlooking, overlooking the, ocean. the ocean, all that kind of stuff. Right. We get there and it's this tiny little apartment with no furniture. A futon, like a basically like little footstools. It, you know, it was it was six footstools. In the <laughs> pictures, it was like this grand sectional sofa and blah, blah. Got in there, it was four Ikea footstools pushed side by side. And there, that's your couch. And like this tiny little kitchen and this disgusting bedroom. And I remember call and I called the owner of the house. I'm like, what the hell is this? She's yeah. Well, what, my other guests like my uh, decorating. It was false advertising. Were they Lego characters? Yeah. Yes, it was false advertising. And that's what it, and, and honestly, I think the MPAA as a self-governing body, they should put some sanctions in place and some rules in place about movies that, that purposefully, again, I understand it can accidentally happen, but that purposefully mislead the audience and showing you things. Because you're, you're basically, the trailer is the box for your product that's on the shelf in in Ikea or Judge wherever it is. By its cover. And if I go in and I buy a box of Legos and there's a figure on the box 
that says you get this figure in here and I get home and I open that box and that figure ain't in there you sold me a false bill of goods and there should be rules about that you order Legos and you get Lincoln logs no thanks yeah no, no thanks <laughs> all right we spent a lot of time on that let's move on let's move on to the next one okay Andrea writes I noticed that a lot of people in the U.S. show animosity towards Marvel movies if they like the DC comic ones, and vice versa. I noticed this in a Rotten Tomatoes and on IMDb fan reviews. Do you have any idea why this is? It truly <laughs> baffles me, and the only explanation I was able to come up with is an eventual joy in upsetting others and talking and taking joy in the misfortune of others, which is frankly... A bit childish. Did you write this to yourself, John? Was this Andrea you, Campion? No, I, you'd think, <laughs> wouldn't you? Dear heavens. Uh, this is the this is like Democrats and Republicans. This is uh, Parliament versus House. This is whatever wherever you live in this world, the two fighting factions here or in the comic book universe, you have Marvel and you have DC. And unfortunately, people that like DC movies want to smash Marvel movies and vice versa. Personally, if the movie's good, we've talked about it. The uh -huh. movie's good good i love it if it's not it's not i'm not going into superman going like god i hope this is bad so i can just go and watch captain america and say you suck it superman no no <laughs> batman v superman just wasn't good captain america civil war was good thor the dark world sucked man of steel was pretty damn good there's there was something to be said the dark knight incredible movie the first Hulk with Ang Lee, a piece of junk. And I know that's on MCU, but it's still a Marvel character. There are ways to love both. You don't have to be that hater like, listen, I don't like anything but my Marvel movies and hell to DC for coming in here hot and trying to ruin my movies. No, can we all just get along, John? Can we have healthy discourse about the future and the state of these movies? Here's the funny thing. First of all, very well stated. Thank well you. done, Sorry. well done. So, I, so look, this is the thing. There are people out there, and I have no problem with this whatsoever. There are people out there, film fans, yeah. who have gone to a bunch of comic book movies. And as it happens, they tend to really like the DC ones, and they tend to not like the Marvel ones. Okay. That's fine. That's great. Then there are the opposites. You know, people who've gone, and it's a bunch, just film fans, go see a bunch of movies, and they end up, hey, I really like all these ones, and they happen to be Marvel ones, and I end up disliking these ones, and they happen to be DC ones. Yeah. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that at all. That's perfectly fine. You're a film fan. You just happen to go to all those movies, and you just happen to really prefer these ones over these ones. Nothing wrong with that at all. But there is a segment of the population out there within the film fandom community. Mm -hmm. A segment that unfortunately the vocal minority, yeah, John. that 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 tends to be the case with almost any community. The dim-witted minority who have the <laughs> biggest mouths, um, who are, and this is this is the label I've created for them because it's an applicable label. They are the corporate zombie slaves. Sure where they don't know how to think for themselves. They've just decided, I am identifying myself as a DC servant. I am, I am totally subservient, obedient to my corporate overlords that is DC. Therefore, anything that DC does, doesn't matter if it's good or bad, I'm only going to look at it one way, that it's the best thing ever done. And anything that their opposition puts out, in this case, say Marvel, even before seeing it, I'm just going to say it's a piece of garbage no matter what. And vice versa. Marvel has their own blind corporate zombie slaves as well. It's like, I am strictly obedient to my Marvel corporate overlords. Anything they do, I will never say anything. All hail Kevin Feige. Yes. And, 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 and anything, therefore, that DC puts out is garbage. That's the segment that is rude. They're not real fans. They're not real comic book movie fans. And again, there are people out there who just saw a bunch of movies and they happen to like the DC ones over the Marvel ones, and that's great and that's pure. But it's the, it's these people that are fake fans that are bad for, for the community, they're bad for movies, they're bad for the movie going um, community just in general, in general that are just blind corporate zombie slaves. And that that just hurts. And it's those people that are vocal minority. But what I've really discovered is they really are a minority. Yeah. They really, really are a, f a finite percentage of a number of a minority. They're just the brave keyboard warriors who think they're tough and they I can say whatever I want because mm -hmm. nobody knows where I live. Um, and it's it, they're the one, it, they hurt people and they hurt uh, the industry. And, and there's almost nothing funnier than watching a room of blind corporate Marvel zombie 
slaves and blind corporate DC zombie slaves mm -hmm. going at it. Yeah. <laughs> that's one uh, of the funniest things. That's called the House of Representatives yeah. here in the United States. But it's not funny when you get those blind corporate zombie slaves into just a chop board of regular film yeah. fans who just make turn people off wanting to be online film fans. Like I, I have talked to people. It's like, no, I don't I don't participate in uh, in live chats or forums anymore or certain Reddit forums anymore. You get attacked all the time because, John, everybody knows here that you are paid both by Marvel and DC, and DC yes. to voice your opinions <laughs> positively about both movies. You are a subjective critic. You have no objectivity in anything that you do. And thus, sitting here with you is a conflict of interest. And will thus, I will have to leave. Well, I put up this graphic the other day. This is how it gets really <laughs> funny because people don't want to see anything but they want they want to see so yep. i literally got this tweet i put out a tweet something about you know uh love comic book movie or something something benign right and i get these two tweets literally within three minutes of each other mm -hmm. and you know what <laughs> screw it i'm gonna i'm gonna Wait find the tweet i'm just gonna open it up and read the damn tweet god it's so good um so so i got these two tweets one after the other i put up on my facebook post but so one tweet says it's the first tweet says, if I can find it here, it should be right. There it is. The first tweet said this. <laughs> Fuck you, John Campia, <laughs> and your constant DC bashing. That Marvel money must be sweet. Okay, let me read one more time. Fuck you, Campia, and your constant DC bashing. That Marvel money must be sweet. Three minutes later, this other tweet shows up in my feed. It's getting really sad watching you sucking DC's dick every chance you get. I hope the checks they give you are worth it. <laughs> Hashtag make mine marvel. So I'd like to bring up, if you're getting all this money, you have yet to pay for lunch for me. Like In, in a full year of working with you, yet to get a lunch. I'm going straight to Feige. I'm like, quit paying Campy until at least I get a BJ's bazooki. Just saying. Yeah, and I don't know if Feige understands that Warner is also paying me, but <laughs> but that's it. But that's the mind of the blind yep. corporate zombie slave that ruined things for everybody. And just like I was saying before, the real dangerous part of this is that like I said, I've talked to film fans who will no longer participate in, in, in what was supposed to be fun places where film fans can go and share ideas and share the things they like and don't like, the, the Reddit forums or the live chat forums or wherever else. And they, they've just told me, I can't participate anymore because of these poisonous, cancerous people. These blind corporate zombie slaves who just go in there and they just make it their mission in their pathetic, useless lives mm -hmm. to make other people miserable. But I, like I said, I have discovered sometimes it can feel like they are the majority, but they don't. Trust me. Level headed thinking, Marvel and DC and comic book fans and movie fans in general are the vast majority. And so. And it, it won't be until like the the majority of these people, of the common sense thinking people who are just fans, hey, you like something different than me? That's cool. Let's share our ideas together. That's how we should be in everything in this world. Yeah, and until those people all band together and really start to shun and shut out the blind corporate zombie slaves, we've got an uphill battle in front of us. But anyway. I'm, I'm just trying to get paid by Golden Key because I'm the only person that liked the <laughs> Phantom movie with Billy Zane. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question comes to us from Ma La, who writes, there are lots of films being released that were correctly predicted to have poor box office and poor critical reviews. My question is, what was the motivation with getting these films made? As surely it can't be a surprise for the people involved in either. Well, you, you might be surprised. Yeah. But, you know, I've said this before. Tell me what you think. Okay. I, look, whenever... A filmmaker sits down and they've got their script and they're in pre-production at this point, right? They all think they have a great movie on their Correct. hands. They all think, I have read scripts. And, and look, this is just to show how easy it is. I have read scripts one or two years in advance of a movie getting made and reading a script and going, this could be something really, really special. And then the movie comes out. It's like, oh, my God, that was horrible. Right. It, I mean, listen, it, there's so much that goes into making a movie, right? Sometimes you read a script. If you read the script for uh, Taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3, you're like, wow, that's a really fun script. Then you put John Travolta and his weird acting performance in that movie, and you're like, this is the most <laughs> And campy. I like John Travolta. And, yeah, most of the time, John Travolta is pretty damn good. But... There are so many things that go into a movie, and a director can only get so much out of a star. Like, listen, at this point, you're not going to get much out of Bruce Willis. He's going to be Bruce Willis, okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I love Die Hard. Die Hard is my favorite Christmas movie of all time, and by far my favorite action movie outside of Bad Boys 2. What I'm saying here is that there is like, 
Midway through production, here's, this is one of my favorite stories about movie making. Every time I see a bomb movie or a movie that shouldn't work, work, I think of the story of Tommy Boy, right? Mm. They get the script for Tommy Boy. It gets <laughs> greenlit. It only gets about a million and a half. Lauren Michael steps on to, get, to give him a little bit more money, and he says, we have Chris Farley and David Spade. As they're shooting Tommy Boy, they're 20 days into shooting, and the director's like, I think this may be the worst movie ever made this may be and, and like they just kept going with production after they were done we're like we don't even know if we have a movie it premiered to nothing and then as word of mouth got out about how funny it was tommy boy made almost 15 million dollars in theaters and then crushed in dvd and yeah. vhs sales it's it's a weird thing um so it's it could be in performance it could be in editing editing it does a ton for movies oh editing is the, edi the movie is made in the editing. correct so again Yes, when they when they find out that it's critically panned or it does poorly at the box office. For me, one of my favorite movies, maybe my favorite comedy in the last 10 years is MacGruber. And MacGruber <laughs> got destroyed by critics. It made nothing in the box office. I'll be honest, I, I didn't like it. Oh I'll my be God, honest, it's I didn't so like good. MacGruber. MacGruber is amazing. And to, I mean, to me, but again, I know a lot of my friends so love subjective. it. It is. So... I don't, again, like you said, they don't go into it thinking, oh, we got a bomb on our hands. Let's make Huntsman Winter's War. But <laughs> they, that's what they get. They, it's unfortunate that in the middle of production, I think a lot of times actors know, but they got they have a job to do. They have contracts to fulfill. And sometimes they have penalties that they have to pay if the studio doesn't put the movie out. Because even if they don't put the movie out, they just sink all that cost. And they put it out, to, at least they make something. Yeah, look, it, it's it's not until you're really well into the movie being done that probably studios and the filmmakers realize, hmm, we might have swung and missed <laughs> on this one. Yes. But this is the other thing. This It all goes back to that I think most average film fans don't understand. Making a good movie, not just an all-time class, right. making a good movie is a monumentally near impossible thing to do. Like, a lot of people are just making a good movie is easy no it's not yeah. it's re when whenever a studio and people put out a movie and i walk out entertained yeah. to me that is a herculean achievement i mean that is a really a big deal so it's not an easy thing to make a good movie and these people who are able to do it and do it on a consistent basis they uh, deserve our applause and our cheers but every one of them who have made a good movie have also put out a movie that sucked that at the beginning they thought this, this is, could be great. Yeah. George Lucas made Howard the Duck. Yeah. So what do you what can you do? <laughs> I, I will say this. Uh I, Robert Evans in that documentary The Kid Stays in the Picture right. all the story about him he said one of the coolest things he said movie making is like being a baseball player you can get paid millions of dollars to go one for three with no runs or like with no RBIs yeah. right because let, let's just look at this year upcoming 2017 have we seen an unbelievably great movie yet? Logan Logan one yeah and we're in May yeah, I'm trying to think. Maybe, maybe if I ran down the list, maybe I'd think one or two others. But yeah, Logan to me is still like the best movie of right? the year so far. So there you go. All right, let's move on to the next question. The next question comes to us from Christopher Piper, who writes, "I absolutely loved Powerless. You, I, you threw. I, okay, I see where you're going. The this scant one. nine episodes we got to see. The humor was spot on, and the characters were no more rough than most first season shows. So why did why did the show get canceled?" It couldn't possibly have been that expensive to make, being mostly a single set show. Well, look, Christopher, you and me on the same page. I, I thought I thought Powerless looked really dumb. And honestly, even most way through the first episode, I thought this is really stupid and juvenile. But at some point, I think the way I described it to you before was my mind kind of got in tune with the level, like with where they were going with it. And to be honest, I thought Alan Tudyk was hilarious in the show. Ron, I never know how to pronounce his life, Fuchs. Funches. Funches. Ronnie Funches. Was hilarious yeah. in the show. Vanessa, Vanessa Hudgens, Hudgens very charming. was very good in the show. And as that show went on and on, I really started to appreciate it and its comedy and its humor and the way it worked. But why did it get canceled? Why everything else gets canceled? Nobody was watching it. I, I mean, that's just the end of the day. I, and to say, oh, but it wasn't that expensive of a show. Look, studios and television networks aren't looking to fill their limited amount of airtime with shows that well, we're not losing that much money with right. it. No, no, they want hit shows. Especially NBC, which NBC, yes. NBC and ABC, ABC always be canceling, right? <laughs> um, and and NBC really, I mean, they are really trying to find that flagship show. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they this year they got it with This Is Us, right? NBC landed a gigantic Amazing hit. Amazing show. With, with Very this is well us. done show. Um, and I think... 
you know, with with a mar with a DC property like Powerless, and that that was a DC property, you were still paying a decent sum of money to use that property from DC. Put that aside. I did I did a little research on the ratings. I watched all nine episodes because we had talked about it. I think it was a charming show. I think you really I thought that I'm dating a henchman episode. That was, was particularly really good. good. Yeah, I liked that, that episode good. a lot. Um, is is you really have to take yourself out of it, and I think a lot of people have a lot of trouble with especially network comedies with taking yourself that far out of it. I think powerless was done a disservice by being on NBC had powerless been on, let's say an FX or a com. Nah, I'm not going to say Comedy central. I don't think they would have that, but let, let's just say FX for, for they could have gone a little m bit more R rated. They could have taken bigger risks. Cause some of the humor was, I know a little edgy, right. like a little push, a little dirty. And let's be honest. The, 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 Network television viewing audience skews older. And what does the, the skewing older doesn't do comic book shows a service? Look at Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. It's a Marvel property that was come off Avengers and it doesn't do well ratings wise. Powerless dipped 25% after its pilot review and never got back to anywhere mm. near yeah. the, the pilot numbers. They were averaging like 1718, some like in almost close to 2 million on network TV. That's really, really bad. Yeah, I mean, 60 Minutes on CBS does almost three. And that's <laughs> 60 Minutes. That's not even primetime television. And NBC is putting, sinking a lot of money into that show, a lot of money in marketing, and nobody is showing up for it. And not only that, critics destroyed it. They did. Nothing. And Medic I get it. And I, even though I love the show, I get why they did. I, yeah. I really do. Like, it, for, it just happened to click with me, but I totally understand. It wasn't going to be a show that had wide. It might have even been a better suited for FXX. Yeah. At, at yeah. that point. So. I mean, look at a show like 30 Rock or Parks and Rec. They never did really well in ratings. They were both on NBC. Never did. But they did well enough. But they did well enough. And the critics absolutely adored them. They got nominated for Golden Globes and Emmys and all the awards. So to, to hang your hat on award winning programming that not a lot of people are saying, that's the old cult classic thing that networks know to hang their hat on. This had neither of that. I totally agree. All right, let's go in our last question of the day. And this one comes from Nick Castagana, who writes, What trilogy should a person watch first, Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit? Now, okay, this is, raises a very, very a deeper, <laughs> more spiritual <laughs> question. And that question is, should one even watch The Hobbit? Now, I enjoy. I, look, I, I enjoyed the Hobbit films. I did, but they they had some glaring, glaring errors they made in that. One one of the, the one of the big errors was, like you had, it was tough at the end of the third Hobbit film, when you've got Oak and Shield finally fighting the White Orc. Yeah. It's tough to feel any emotional investment when we hadn't seen the two of them on screen together. In like four or five years and, since the first film, and, and Oak so, and Shield's kind of a dick. He was, but actually, you know what? I really did like Oak okay. and Shield, I, and I think the dickish side of him is part of the thing that I really got to appreciate okay. about him. Especially like his life was pretty messed yeah, up. Yeah, I mean, he had best. some dark stuff going yeah. on in his yeah. life. But I mean, the problem with the third film was the third. Look, you look at the original Lord of the Rings film, right? It's one big gigantic story, yes. But each film had its own beginning, middle, and mm -hmm. end, with elements introduced, set up, and then brought to conclusion in each film. Like the Hobbit films, the entire third film was the third act. It was all just action and payoff, 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 payoff. But all the setup was done in film one and two, whereas the Lord of the Rings had introduction, setup, and payoff all in the same film for each one, two, and three. The Hobbit lost focus of that. Now look, if you are the type of person you think, I want to watch both, then I would say watch The Hobbit first. Okay. Watch it in sequential order, <laughs> not in the order in which it was produced. The Hobbit, the story of The Hobbit comes before Lord of the Rings. Um, but really, even though I like the films, I don't recommend people watching The Hobbit. If you have not seen Lord of the Rings yet, which heavens why have you not seen the lord of the rings films <laughs> but if you haven't how dare you sir i would just say honestly brush the hobbit films aside and just watch the lord of the rings and enjoy here's here's what i will say and i we are in complete agreement uh i i watch i watched the first hobbit movie and i was thought this is pretty good i liked it but that hobbit the three hobbit movies it's one book versus three giant tomes one small book one small book <laughs> that you had to read in school again verse three i mean hefty books okay the Hobbit should have been one movie. 
It, it really it could have most been, two. At most two. Which the original plan was to do it as two. Right. And I remember we were at Comic Con with Peter Jackson. I'm standing there with Peter Jackson, and he goes, "And by the way, we're we've decided to make the two Hobbit films into a trilogy. We're going to make it three. And it's like, uh, <laughs> how's that now? Really? The because I got my copy of The Hobbit right here. It's about <laughs> this thick. Like <laughs> it's a Cliff's Notes, uh, <laughs> but it, I think for me, I think you skip The Hobbit. Uh, because by the time you f- you are finished with the Hobbit, you don't want to go anywhere near Middle Earth. If you want to really enjoy mi- like the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, watch those movies. If you loved them, maybe go watch the first Hobbit movie and give it a chance. But don't spoil. Don't eat the entire loaf of bread before your main course comes. Watch the Lord of the Rings. It's so good. Yeah, absolutely. Watch all three films. All three are masterpieces. All three nominated for Best Picture. Awesome. And of course, the third one winning. What is the only other trilogy? Where all three we films this. were nominated for Best Picture. Godfather. Correct. Correct, sir. Yes, yes, sir, The Godfather. All right, guys, that'll do it for our time today on this episode of Mailbag. Thanks so much for joining us. Don't forget, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Stay up to date on everything we got going on here on our channel. I want to thank my co-host today, Mr. Josh McCuga. Where can people find you? Uh, at Josh McCuga on Twitter and Instagram. Collider TV Talk every Monday. So much stuff happening in TV this week with all the upfronts, shows, trailers, a ton to talk about this Monday. 2 p.m. live at Collider Video right here on this channel. And of course, you guys can find me uh, Monday through Thursday on Movie Talk. Of course, Dennis and the, the other crew, they take over and do a great job on Fridays. You can follow me on social media, on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Just at John Campy. A special thanks to John Boyko behind the camera. And a special thanks to you guys for watching this show with us. We'll be back again tomorrow. See you next time.